War II. In America, a handful of young men refused to be drafted from an American concentration camp. Somewhere down the line, when you get pushed back so far, someplace on the line, you have to, you have to take a stand someplace. Restore our rights and free our families, they said, and we'll be glad to fight. They paid a price, two years in prison, 50 years scorned by their own people. They were written out of history until now. Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, created by Congress to sponsor research into the wartime incarceration of Japanese Americans. A complete list is available from PBS. For me, it's been 52 years ago, <laughs> 52 years now. I do remember this uh, going uphill a little bit. You remember this? No, I don't remember. Yeah. No, uh, most I remember is the uh, terrific dust storm that we uh, were in when we first got here. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing, it doesn't bring any fond memories. Heart Mountain is a landmark in the high desert of Wyoming. I don't know who built these, did the... Uh... Oh, I think the evacuees built this whole thing for their farm crops. It, for their farm crops? For storage. Do you know what kind of vegetables were in there? Probably root vegetables, primarily. I think this was actually outside of the uh, fenced-in area of the camp. See, the camp periphery was pretty much along that bluff there. When we got to Heart Mountain, none of us knew we were going to be prisoners or war heroes or resistors. This was a concentration camp. They wanted to draft me. I thought this was wrong. Heart Mountain Relocation Center was one of 10 camps inside the United States. They held 120,000 people expelled from their homes on the West Coast. Their only crime was their race. After Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Americans of Japanese ancestry drew the anger and fear of a nation. The president ordered mass exclusion and detention without any evidence of sabotage or imminent invasion. There was no military need. And you have to understand the hostility that we faced overnight, suddenly, we were the enemy. Blood is thicker than water. You can't trust these slant-eyed Japs. The Japanese people, as a community, were made to feel as though they were every bit as guilty for having a Japanese face as the enemy. But two-thirds of those evicted were U.S. citizens the Nisei, or second generation, citizens by virtue of birth in America. They were young and full of hope. Their parents were the Issei, or first generation immigrants. Racial laws barred the older Issei from U.S. citizenship. Many Issei leaders were arrested immediately after Pearl Harbor. Some families fled while they could to the free zone outside the West Coast. By summer, everyone who remained was ordered to pack only what they could carry and leave. Gosh, we could only take 50 pounds a piece, and what we ended up taking was uh, a few clothes for ourselves, but mostly our daughter's clothes, and we took canned milk and things like that. We had to walk between the soldiers with their bayonets out. And here we are, only two luggage. And then they had the jeep with a mounted machine gun behind these soldiers, 
going back and forth. First, they were tagged with numbers and held at temporary detention centers, most no more than horse stalls at the local racetrack. Draft boards reclassified the young Nisei as enemy aliens, like their parents. Not citizens as they once were. Many who demanded the expulsion got rich off it. Japanese Americans lost property and income worth three to ten billion dollars today. You had to give up your home, give up your possessions, and wander into the desert and live under the most extreme conditions. Of course, the army did take care that the Japs would be made to suffer. They chose the worst places, the hell holes, <laughs> that are to be found in this beautiful United States. They had initially been promised that they were going to be moved inland and they could form their own community and live in a democratic fashion. They were shocked to see that they were surrounded by barbed wire and guard towers. Even the president called them concentration camps. The rifles pointed inside, not out. Mother always told us, never to cross the barbed wire fence. And she used to point to the guard up there and said, you know, he has a rifle and he's going to shoot you if you cross the barbed wire fence. They cooperated with the government. Now they were prisoners. At Heart Mountain, many from sunny California didn't even own a top coat. Turned out that that winter was the coldest winter in Wyoming history. It was 30 below zero. And uh, if you go to the uh, restroom, which was located outside, and uh, wet your hands, and, or took a shower and your hair was uh, wet, by the time you get by, got back to your barrack, your head was in icicles, and uh, your hand was wet, it would just stick to the metal door, doorknob. But the only hardship that mattered was the loss of their rights based solely on their race. I couldn't vote, I couldn't get out, I couldn't go to school, I couldn't go out to work, I was just held. A lot of people didn't know who they were. You know, they were in limbo. Why didn't they resist? Following the arrest of the Issei, leadership of the community was assumed by the Japanese American Citizens League, which pledged total compliance with the government. The JACL emerged in 1930 from groups of professionals eager to prove their Americanism and loyalty. Only the Nisei, born in America as citizens, could belong. Some bragged of leading raids with the FBI to round up the older Issei leaders. JACL informers were called Inu, Japanese for dogs. In general, the, the policy of the JACL was to collaborate with the, with the government, to collaborate uh, with, the, uh, with, with some of the chief oppressors of the, uh, of the, of the Japanese-American people. And you can certainly justify this as a political tactic. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to justify it as, as a moral position. That first winter, the government allowed the JACL to hold an emergency meeting in Salt Lake City with two delegates from each camp. It was led by National Secretary Mike Masaoka, a champion debater and a Mormon. He insisted the young Nisei must spill their blood for America. He was somebody who had not been brought up around too many other Japanese Americans, and yet he was catapulted into this position of the head of the Japanese American Citizens League, which means that he did not have a lot of community restraint. And he did have, because of his Mormonism, a hyper-Americanism. Mike Masaoka had earlier proposed the Nisei form a suicide battalion whose parents would be held by the government as hostages. 
Now he called for drafting the young men out of camp. If they could be drafted, then they were equal Americans. The JACL delegates agreed and returned to their camps. The reaction was, what? They want to raid a concentration, you know, concentration camps for bodies to, 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 I mean, to be shot at? We went quietly when they forced us out of uh, our homes. But now they want us to risk our lives for something that uh, we, we weren't privy to, for democracy, which was denied us. At Manzanar, in the California desert, one of the JACL delegates was beaten and hospitalized. A riot broke out. Soldiers shot and killed two men. The public called for segregation of so-called disloyals. Mike Masaoka offered a plan to identify those he called agitators. As JACL spokesman, Masaoka himself was never put in camp. A month later, the Army announced it would readmit Japanese Americans, but not through the draft. Volunteers would be taken for a segregated unit led by white officers. 27-year-old Mike Masaoka was the first volunteer for the new unit. Boy, when an immigrant becomes a patriot, he usually becomes a 200% patriot. Well, we know what 100% Americans do. 200% Americans do even worse. And I think this was one of the problems of many of the JCL leaders, that they were trying to be 200% uh, Americans. I'm from Seattle. After war was declared, I was evacuated from the Pacific Coast. When the call came for volunteers for a combat team, I volunteered from a relocation center to show my loyalty and to prove that I had the right to live as a good American citizen. I tried to understand their viewpoint, but to me, I have nothing to prove. I am an American citizen, I never did anything wrong, and I don't have to prove myself. But the government did want proof to weed out what it called the rotten apples. It demanded every adult in camp sign a loyalty oath. All the questions were innocuous except 27 and 28. 27. Are you willing to serve in the armed forces of the United States on combat duty wherever ordered? And if you answered yes, it was an implication that you volunteered. 28. Will you swear unqualified allegiance to the United States of America? and forswear any form of allegiance or obedience to the Japanese emperor. And if uh, Nisei answered yes to that, it seemed like you had at one time or another pledged allegiance to the emperor of Japan. No one in camp, not even the director, was sure of the consequences of a yes or no answer. How would you like to be asked, are you loyal or disloyal? I mean, have you ever thought about it? It was gut-wrenching because if you were the oldest son, your loyalty belonged first to the family. You must take care of your mother and father. Many parents feared this was a plot to rob them of their sons. Frank Emmy stepped forward with a way to answer. I said, under the present conditions and circumstances, I'm unable to answer these questions. I answered with a qualification. We would be willing to serve in the uh, armed, armed forces of the United States, provided they return our constitutional rights and return us, my parents and my sister, back to where I, I have a home. I didn't do good in school, but one thing that my teachers instilled into me was the Constitution of the United States and how it's supposed to protect all minorities and all of its citizens. Frank Emmy handprinted copies of his answers and posted them throughout camp. And Frank and I went on a midnight excursion through all the uh, latrines, actually. Frank Emmy had been a grocer. Now he was an activist. 
but activists were not welcome. You don't do much bitching in a concentration camp. If you're docile, if you're quiet, if everything is going all right, the vast majority of the people are going to get treated okay. 12,000 who did not answer yes to the loyalty oath were branded as disloyal and shipped to a segregation center at Thule Lake near the California-Oregon border, just as JACL had urged. And do you know that we had six tanks that guarded that compound of Thule Lake? And to think that this was free America, it's almost unbelievable. The most tragic thing about the whole leadership is that the leaders of the JCL at that time strongly felt and believed that they were doing the right thing, and yet they were doing the wrong thing. They were really a government agent. That's all they were. The drive for volunteers fell short. Of 14,000 single men of draft age in the camps, only 1,200 volunteered. The government and the JACL needed a hero. One appeared, a farmer's son who volunteered from the free zone of Nebraska, Sergeant Ben Kuroki. I was a top third gunner when we flew the mission over the Ploeste oil refineries. That was a great feeling. You finally felt that you belonged, you know. And I finally felt that I was going to have a chance to prove myself. Pearl Harbor made Kuroki feel guilty and ashamed of his Japanese ancestry. To prove his loyalty, he begged to see combat in the Air Corps. You sit there with two 50 caliber machine guns and you're just helpless. You can't do a damn thing. You can't fight back because those anti-aircraft shells, those 88 millimeter German shells are coming up there in the tons. <laughs> And you, know, you feel the plane move this way, behind it. and you sit there, oh God, let's get the hell out of here. Kuroki survived 30 missions and earned two distinguished flying crosses. He was the first national hero for Japanese America and the perfect poster boy for JACL. Nineteen forty four marked the second winter in camp. On New Year's Day, they pounded rice into mochi cakes, just as if they were home. From overseas came word of heavy casualties among the first Nisei soldiers. The government announced it would now draft the young men in camp. As soon as I heard the news, or read the news, I was determined not to go. What's right is right, what's wrong is wrong, and government is wrong. For some, it was the last straw. At Heart Mountain, they organized and Frank Emmy would lead them. An engineer named Kiyoshi Okamoto had been writing manifestos calling himself the Fair Play Committee of One. He taught Emmy about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. With Okamoto as chair, the Fair Play Committee typed bulletins, held meetings, and elected officers. We collected uh, $2 a piece from the Fair Play Committee members to uh, set up a fund in case we had to have legal uh, uh, action. Protests were raised at other camps, but they were unfocused and leaderless. These caught the eye of a journalist in the free zone of Denver. They were spouting out about their loyalty to Japan and stuff like that, and I felt that they were taking the wrong approach because they weren't disloyal, but out of frustration were making these wild statements. James Omura 
had publicly protested the mass incarceration. He said the JACL betrayed Japanese America by collaborating with the government. As editor of the Rocky Shimpo newspaper, his editorials fanned the growing resistance. And I felt that someone should throw out what I felt was an anchor that, uh, that these people could use that would be substantial. The Nisei are well within their rights to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Beyond that... We couldn't say directly anything that would be critical of, of the, the United States government policy. So we had to be oblique about it. I couldn't tell the people to organize, but in essence, I was telling them to organize. Well, that really uh, helped us morally because uh, we felt that uh, James O'Murro was uh, in our corner. We also felt that since his paper was being distributed in other camps, that it would, might stir up the other camps. Guntaro Kubota, a Japanese language school teacher trained in the law, translated the Fair Play bulletins into Japanese. I thought, gee, we have to fight for our rights. You know, that's all we know is this country. And so when my husband was asked to interpret what the uh, Fair Play boys were saying, I thought, well, that's the only way they could make the money, raise the money, because they knew eventually they're going to court. As the protest gained momentum, the first draft orders arrived in camp. I was 18 here at Heart Mountain when the loyalty questionnaires came up. At that time, I didn't have any problem. I was apolitical. I was a white person. I wanted to be drafted. I wanted to serve my country. The first group of draftees was told to report. When the day arrived, all 17 boarded the bus that took them to their pre-induction physicals. If the Fair Play Committee was to make a difference, it had to do more than protest. Some wavered. I remember arguing that if we don't take a definite stand, it's not gonna do any good. At a packed mess hall rally, the Fair Play Committee crossed the line from protest to resistance. We feel the present program of drafting us from this concentration camp is unjust, unconstitutional, and against all principles of civilized usage. Therefore, we members of the Fair Play Committee hereby refuse to go to the physical examination or to the induction if or when we are called in order to contest the issue. If ever there was a time or... I didn't feel there was really a choice. We all had an obligation, a responsibility, to publicize or to raise the issue of the incarceration, the uh, evacuation, at whatever opportunity we had. This certainly presented an opportunity, one that um, uh, if we were to overlook it at this point, then we virtually accept the evacuation as a normal condition. I know my dad was 100% uh, behind me. I had no real concern about him. My mother, on the other hand, like a normal mother, was concerned and at one point uh, uh, even begged me to consider being like the rest of the guys and just go along and don't make waves. Within a week, five young men refused to board the bus. The next week, seven more failed to appear. The Fair Play Committee had a test case. But the Citizens League was on record as unalterably opposed to test cases. After Pearl Harbor, Min Yasui, an Oregon attorney, deliberately violated a military curfew as his own test case. JCL denounced him as a self-styled martyr. Now the JACL newspaper, The Pacific Citizen, 
In the camp newspaper, the Heart Mountain Sentinel vilified this new resistance. In the hidden recesses of boiler rooms and latrines, behind closed doors and under protection of darkness, leaders of the Fair Play Committee have fired with fanatical zeal. They call us half-witted, uh, nuts, uh, demented, and uh, we were seditionists and disloyals and everything under the sun. These deluded youths have our deepest sympathy. This so-called Fair Play Committee... The editorials at that particular period are an absolute disgrace. Their position was not only nasty, at times it was gratuitously nasty. Uh, I, I think they went around with, with a meat axe. Every week, dozens more failed to report for induction, even though the penalty was five years in prison and a $10,000 fine. I wasn't exactly thrilled about their taking up the draft case because I knew the consequences of a draft case. But I also understood that that was the last hitch that they had left that, w that they could hold to or, or, or become a part of. And so uh, I supported that. To prove they were not free, three Fair Play leaders tried to walk out of camp without a pass. Uh, MP stopped us and said if we kept walking, he would shoot us. And a few people did get shot, you know, being too close to the fence or something, so we knew he wasn't kidding. As the pressure grew, the chair of the Fair Play Committee privately appealed to the national director of the American Civil Liberties Union. Roger Baldwin was advised to deny aid to Kiyoshi Okamoto. Baldwin apparently consulted with leaders of the Japanese American Citizens League in Salt Lake City and answered Okamoto in a public letter, which was made public before Okamoto received it, denouncing what he was doing, saying that they had no right to do this, etc. something the American Civil Liberties Union today would absolutely deny. JACL released Baldwin's letter to undercut resistance. The government cracked down, starting with Okamoto. The next target was James Omura, the only journalist to challenge JACL's leadership. National JACL wanted Omura charged with sedition and gave copies of his newspaper to the FBI the government removed Omura as editor. Then it sent the war hero, Ben Kuroki, to build morale and recruitment inside the camps. I was really quite shocked when I approached Dark Mountain and came up to the, to the gate and saw these armed guards and they were all wearing the same uniform I was wearing. And inside, behind the barbed wire, was all these, uh, my own people. At Heart Mountain, Kuroki got a hero's welcome. His valor had been embraced by the nation. 3,000 people, one-third of the entire camp, came out to see him. And I had a high school education, and. I was not cut out for speaking or anything like that. It was just like all this was thrust onto me. I think I was really gung-ho, you know, and I probably irritated a few of the resistors from all some of the things that I said. Kuroki said in combat he found the acceptance he craved. Those who fought the draft lacked initiative, he said, and were being influenced by their parents. We just thought that he was an asshole for coming into camp for uh, uh, trying to persuade the young men to enlist in, in the army when he himself was a Nebraska boy, never knew anything about the camps. But he was a free American. He didn't have to endure what we had to go through. By April, 336 men had been inducted from Heart Mountain. Yet the day Kuroki left, six more resisted the draft. The 
The arrests began at dawn. I was picked up by the FBI. They came bright and early. They knocked on the door and I says, well, let me get a few clothing, underwear and stuff. Well, no, no, you won't need that. So we went to the office and then they tried to get you to change your mind. And I says, no, I'm standing by my convictions. I want this constitutional uh, civil rights restored before I go. I says, if you can do that, I'll be glad and willing to go. At Heart Mountain, one of every nine young men drafted refused induction. So many were arrested, they had to be spread to county jails throughout Wyoming state. Anytime you go into, into a jail and face, face the federal government, uh, it's not a very positive feeling. Um, especially when you, when you know that your community leaders and Japanese American leaders were against you. One leader against them was Min Yasui. His own test case had been rejected. He now represented the JACL, which sent him and Mike Masaoka's brother to lean on the resistors in jail. They mentioned uh, uh, the discredit that uh, we were bringing to the Japanese American society in general. And, um, but uh, I think the re real purpose of being there was uh, uh, they were seeking larger game uh, in that um, they uh, tried to get me to implicate uh, by naming names um, people, the uh, leaders of the Fair Play Committee. Yasui filed a confidential report with the FBI suggesting the violators be put in solitary confinement to break their will. But the men kept their spirits high, composing jailhouse songs the guards could not understand. As they awaited trial, the Allies began the liberation of Europe. D-Day. American forces at Normandy suffered more than 3,000 casualties fighting for freedoms those in camp didn't have. One week later, at the federal courthouse in Cheyenne, Wyoming, 63 resistors from Heart Mountain stood trial for draft evasion. Some wore their high school sweaters. Some in back hid from the camera but all chose this as their battlefield. We are not considering whether to report for the draft or not, to live or to die as a true issue. We consider the principles of freedom as guaranteed by the Constitution to be the thing we're fighting for. Our conscience and our hearts shall be clear knowing that we have had the courage to fight for a fundamental principle. Maybe I was naive, but I felt that we had a very strong case. Article 1 in the, in the uh, Bill of Rights says that if the government uh, denies you uh, the right of American citizenship, that you have a right to redress it. And nowhere in the Constitution does it say that uh, a good public image is more important than constitutional rights. The soldiers inducted from the camps saw their first combat that same month. They fought with distinction, but their record did not answer the constitutional questions raised by the camps. Unit publicist Mike Masaoka warned that the draft resistance would undo the good image created by the soldiers and cause them to have shed their blood in vain. The Pacific Citizen, the JACL newspaper, threatened the resistors with what it called final ostracism from American society. 
In Wyoming, the trial of the resistors took two weeks. The judge handed down the verdict. Guilty. They were sentenced to three years in a federal penitentiary. Half were sent to Leavenworth, Kansas. The rest to McNeil Island, Washington. I was concerned about uh, my parents having to live with this now, that it's down in black and white, that we were convicted and that uh, we were doing jail time. And uh, knowing the closed nature of the Japanese community, uh, I did have a lot of concern for how they were holding up to this. July 1944. In camp, the Buddhists celebrated Bonodori, the summer festival for one's ancestors. With the first group of resistors behind bars, the government came back to Heart Mountain to arrest the leaders behind the organized resistance. Two FBI's came early in the morning to our barrack. They came right in, said, we're going we're to arrest you. Uh, you're indicted for conspiracy, said the whole thing. Then they started looking around the place and started picking up my papers and things. So I told them, wait, you, you've got to have a uh, search warrant to uh, search my place. And they said, no, this, this is incidental to the rest. We can uh, do it. Guntar Kubota, an older Issei, was not even eligible for the draft. He was arrested. We knew it was coming. They took him away about 10 days after, I guess, my son was born. So, and they came in and just, you know, went through everything. Our unit was small, but, you know, when they mix up everything, it could be nerve wracking, and I was right there. And after they left, I guess because it was soon after I had my son that I just went blind. I just couldn't see a thing. I was worried because I didn't know how long I'd be blind, but fortunately, I was okay the next day. In Denver, the FBI arrested the journalist, James O'Mora. They finally let me have a, a make one phone call after my arraignment. Uh, as we were going out of the building, there's a bank of uh, telephone, and they said I can now make my phone call. So uh, I called my wife and asked her to get in touch with the lawyer. Omura and seven others were charged with conspiracy to counsel draft evasion, but Omura had never met or spoken with the resistors. The only evidence against him was his writing. I always knew that eventually they would come around to something like this. So naturally, I was uh, very careful that I didn't step over the line. The only thing I could think at the time was that uh, it was a matter of race, uh, racism. And um, I worried a great deal about racism, about going to trial. That's the only thing that worried me, whether, whether I would be convicted on this type of uh, evidence uh, simply because I was a person of Japanese ancestry. To raise a defense fund, Omura appealed to the writers he once published. He received not one dime. His wife took a second job to pay his attorney. When Gloria Kubota's husband was taken away, neighbors began to whisper. Of course, people want to know how I'm taking it, you know, so they were just going back and forth because I lived on the end of the unit, you know, kind of. But I didn't show any emotion because I, you know, I believed what my husband and those boys were doing. 
The Fair Play Committee was tried in the same federal courthouse as the young draft resistors. On the government's witness list was the war hero, Ben Kuroki. Yeah, that was a strange, kind of strange one when I was ordered to go there and I was supposed to represent the gov I mean, for uh, testify for the government, but they never called me to testify. During the trial, Frank Emmy kept notes. Their attorney argued the resistance was an act of civil disobedience in the best American tradition. Our attorney was very sharp. So some of us, well, we might be able to pull this through, but uh, when the jury found us guilty, we weren't really surprised. The leaders got two to four years each. Their attorney quickly appealed. Well, I ac accepted it because I didn't think that anybody would get off. In fact, I was surprised that he didn't get longer than the other people because, you know, being he doesn't have citizens. But they asked him why he was, you know. He says, well, I have two children born in this country. As a father, I am interested in their welfare. They have rights, you know. Interviewed after the trial, Ben Kuroki called the resistance a stab in the back and complained its leaders were tearing down the good image he and others had fought for. James Amour was the only defendant found not guilty. As a journalist, he was protected by the First Amendment and freedom of the press. When I was acquitted, I felt I was vindicated personally, and I was vindicated in my profession. The married men said goodbye to their families. Well, that was taken when our son was 99 days old because his father got to come home before he had to get moved, I think, to Leavenworth. So uh, we thought we better have a picture taken, so we had that picture taken. At Leavenworth, they did hard time with bank robbers, crime bosses, and con artists. There was, I think, eight of us in one cell. We knew this was part of the price we had to pay for our uh, resistance. Frank Emmy and several others knew judo. They organized a prison exhibition. After uh, we got warmed up, we would uh, have uh, throwing each other and have the little guys throwing the big guys. And um, this is the first time these uh, inmates ever saw anything like that. And they were really wide-eyed and uh, really surprised. And they gave us a uh, round of applause. And uh, we always felt that that was one reason we were left alone. By 1944, the threat of Japanese invasion had long passed. But President Roosevelt waited until his re-election to a fourth term before closing the camps and allowing Japanese America to go home. The JACL did not relish the thought of recreating Japantowns and little Tokyos. It wanted assimilation. It urged the young Nisei to move to the East and Midwest and become, in its words, quiet Americans an image idealized in this government film shown in camp. The way ahead, where does it lead? That's what this young couple is wondering. Their life together lies in front of them. Whatever it holds, they're sure that it lies in the United States. The news of the end of World War II came to the resistors through a radio piped into their cells. It was 1945. The nation welcomed home the Nisei soldiers as heroes. The effect of the 442nd uh, and the propaganda about the 442nd was, of course, an important part of the rehabilitation, again, quote unquote, of the Japanese American people, of improving their public image, and it did a lot of good. No one but their families waited for the resistors. 
Gloria Kubota moved her children to a Wyoming boarding house. From his cell, her husband sent them letters. I didn't read the letters because I couldn't read, but I always looked forward to the cartoons and the pictures. Some of the pictures were of my um, brother as he perceived my brother to be as he was growing up. His English was absolutely horrible. And he writes this letter. Frank Emmy taught him how to, uh, Frank Emmy was not a very good teacher because this is the letter. Dear Gloria and Makiko, I am very sorry to Makiko. Last time I was sent to picture for Hidemaro. That's my brother Gordon. I know Maki want to, but I was very busy to draw a picture. It's occurred to me since then how anybody could be very busy in prison. And then there was one picture that was drawn of him that I later found out was drawn by Frank Emmy. He and Frank Emmy were cellmates and they must have had an inordinate amount of time to do this because the, the pictures were always in color and it was done with a great deal of care. On Christmas 1945, an appeals court threw out the convictions of the Fair Play Committee leaders. It ruled the jury improperly ignored civil disobedience as a defense. We got the telegram and uh, everybody got together and we showed them uh, there, there was a chorus of hallelujah, you know, everybody was cheering. He says, uh, yeah, he says, we won. We were given a new suit and uh, $25 and a train ticket to Los Angeles. Come by. Come by. Come by. Come by. Frank Emmy raised a toast to his attorney. He was home by early 1946. But the Supreme Court declined to hear the appeal from the young men in the mass trial. They served more than two years and were released later in 1946. All but one. Days before his release, Fred Irie was electrocuted working in the prison powerhouse. On Christmas 1947, the resistors learned they had been pardoned by President Truman. They were just boys when they were called upon to take a stand as men. From a camp, they resisted the draft. But after the war, several of these same men were drafted again during the Korean War. And as free citizens with all their rights, they served. Then you're a veteran. I'm a veteran, right. <laughs> you know how many people like So many of the veterans feel that my buddies put their life on the line and some of them never came back. But you know, these dissidents also put their, not only their life, but their reputation and their whole life uh, on the line in the sense that how they would be accepted in the Japanese American community. And they did this because they really felt that what they were doing was correct. To his death, Mike Masaoka characterized the draft resistors as, quote, a relatively small number of dissidents and insisted the true heroes were the 26,000 Nisei soldiers. And all the historians in their ivory towers who are never there are people who want to write scenarios for books and scripts for plays. They weren't there. We were. It's very important who writes history. History is usually written by the winners. And in the short term, the, the, the JCL people or people who believed in that point of view, the people who wanted to improve the image of the Japanese American people, uh, in the short run, they controlled the history. That's obviously no longer the case. Unrecognized and forgotten, those who resisted rebuilt their lives in isolation. James Omura never ran a newspaper again. Well, I went broke and uh, had to start from scratch. 
I went into landscape contracting, feeling that uh, there, why the Japanese people couldn't touch me. The school teacher, Guntaro Kubota, struggled to earn a living. And after camp, he comes out, and for a long time, I thought he was a different person. As a child, I remember him as kind of a robust, happy soul, and he came back a much more subdued individual. And for a long time, I thought it wasn't the same person. The shame of having a son called a draft dodger hurt parents as well. I believe that my uh, mother suffered because of the stand I took. She got ostracized. She got cut away from the Issei community. And the last thing that happened was she was told to uh, not come to church anymore. So she told me, I can't even go to church. And it was shortly thereafter she took her life. By 1988, the government admitted the camps were wrong and apologized and awarded symbolic compensation of $20,000 each. We Japanese Americans and the government have finally resolved the constitutional issue of our internment. However, the Nisei resistors, many of whom are gone now, have been mistreated and made pariahs within the Japanese American community. Some of us feel the social ostracism was unjustified and must end. In 1999, JCL members born after the war pushed the group to apologize for its suppression of wartime resistance. Approval hinged on one district in central California. So this resolution acknowledges that the resistance of conscience had their constitutional right to protest. Uh, they decided to protest in one of the few ways they could at that time in order to stand up for Japanese American rights. I think that that's very important for us to have uh, as an American lesson, as a lesson for the Japanese American community too. This is wartime, and wartime <laughs> ignores a lot of so-called constitutional rights. I call for my secretary to call the roll and the chapters will please respond to your, your vote. Delano? Reconcile. Fresno? Oppose the resolution. Sometime I'm walking with my wife down the street in San Jose, a couple of, um, come down the street and the wife will say, oh, that was a nice article that you wrote in the paper and uh, I'm happy for you. But the husband, he's looking at the sky, you know, you know how he's thinking, you know. He could tell right away. The people against you. We have three in favor of? Three in favor. Uh, eight opposing. Eight opposing. And three abstaining. And three abstaining. And one with no vote. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. The Let's apology was break, defeated. And then we'll get back to our other Some will never forgive. But others celebrate the discovery that Japanese America did not endure the loss of all their civil rights and three years in camp without some kind of protest or resistance. Several generations from now, these Heart Mountain resistors are going to become legendary figures. They are going to be proudly pointed to as having been young people who would not put up with what the government, what our community leaders felt was best for us. Well, where are you, Dave? I still haven't located myself. <laughs> Might be I have too much hair. <laughs> It's been said Americanism is not a matter of race or ancestry. Americanism is a matter of the mind and heart. It was said about those who fought in combat, but these men fought on their own battlefield. They took a stand as Americans, and they paid a price for being the conscience of their community. Come on up.
To learn more about the resistors, visit us at pbs.org. Major funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the Civil Liberties Public Education Fund, created by Congress to sponsor research into the wartime incarceration of Japanese Americans. A complete list is available from PBS.